action-packed chapter. After using the last few chapters to provide updates on all the different stages of the Onigashima battle, we get another one of those straight action-filled chapters focusing on the rooftop, and hey, we love to see it. Hello my Nakamatachi, this is Joy Girl with a review of chapter 1009, Naraku. And this marks our break from chapter titles being named after characters currently involved in the raid, which I did mention in the last chapter review that I believed we will be getting a title that is somehow related to the rooftop battle, but not necessarily named after any of the characters. Which is exactly what we got here with this title, Naraku, which means hell in Japanese, seemingly referring to the situation on top of the Skull Dome, and a callback to Kit's line from the last chapter, that they are in a living hell in this fight against two of the Yonko, but more on that fierce stage later because Naraku could also be a kabuki theatre reference, as Naraku means the area beneath the main stage. It is from this basement area where equipment and mechanisms for the main stage is set up, and so I think I may have figured out the naming system for the future chapter titles. The kabuki stage title could be setting the scene, and then the following chapters with the character titles could treat the focus individuals as prominent actors who are involved in that stage. We will have to wait to see if we get more character titles and then another stage title to confirm my theory, but there does seem to be a pattern here. And the connection between the Wano arc and a Kabuki play is a very interesting topic in itself, which I would like to discuss in another video, perhaps when this arc is finished, but in any case, please subscribe to this channel now so that you don't miss out on any of these future discussions. For now, let's discuss the color spread. So we receive a glorious colour spread of the Straw Hats as chapter 1009 does mark 100 chapters since we've started the Wano arc. And this one is very, very interesting because we also see the inclusion of Tama along with her companions Bunbuku and Komachio with the aspiring Kunoichi running off with Luffy's Straw Hat. And whilst this does raise eyebrows as to what this may mean for Tama's prospects of joining the Straw Hat crew, we do also have to note that this colour spread was inspired from a request sent in by a fan, so it's possible that this is just a fun colour spread without any further meaning, or maybe Oda did choose this request for a reason. Anyways, whilst everyone is focusing on the possibility of Tama joining the crew, I'm just hoping that this spread isn't to foreshadow 6 deaths in the Wano arc, as there are 6 Jizo statues wherein among other things, Jizo statues are considered to protect the spirits of children who have passed away. And even aside from these meaningful elements, Oda has packed in quite a lot of detail into this spread, as almost each of the characters are drawn with a jacket that has words or phrases written on their left side, which relate to each of their personalities. Luffy's sense of adventure is characterized by the words, Sail away from safe harbor, which I believe is a reference to Mark Twain's quote, wherein the full quote is, Sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade wind in your sails. Explore, dream, discover. And this perfectly encompasses Luffy's journey to become the Pirate King. Zoro's arm reads three swords, and in fact his jacket also has three zippers at the front. Sanji's says, I will cook, as well as the numbers 3 and 2, which could refer to both his birthday, the 2nd of March, as well as how if you add 3 and 2 together, that makes 5, which marks how he was the 5th Straw Hat member. Jinbei has a whale or shark drawing as well as the letters M-O-U and maybe an N or another M, but it's a bit unclear as to what that word is meant to be. Brook also only showing letters, but this seems to be the beginning of the word skeleton. Nami says unchart as well as a W and an A at the back. And this is fitting because Nami's goal is to complete a world map and uncharted refers to undrawn locations of the seas and Frankie's front reads Cyborg whilst his arm has hentai written on it. I didn't actually notice the hentai at first, and was actually hoping that this would be made into a real life jacket so that I could get me one, but now I'm not too sure whether I want to walk around with hentai written on my arm. Anyways, as for the other straw hats, there are no visible inscriptions, though I should mention, I don't know if it's just me, but Usopp's jacket makes him look like he has Chopper's monster point body. And also, Tama seems to have windmill patterns on her kimono. 
Now, that's what I could pick out, but I'm sure there's much more to it than that. So please let me know your ideas by commenting below as to any other further elements present in this color spread and what they may mean because I am very interested. On to the chapter itself. The first scene we got in this chapter is the long-awaited confrontation between the Scabbards and Orochi. And personally, I find this scene very funny. I know it's a serious scene, but I thought it was hilarious that most of the suspenseful aspect of this meeting was so quickly dealt with. In fact, all contained into one double spread. I have been anticipating this fateful meeting and how Orochi would taunt the scabbards about Kanjuro, as well as his reaction after seeing Kyoshiro again, and of course, for the scabbards to slice Orochi's heads off. All of these, I tried to imagine how they would occur, but never in any of my imagined scenarios did I expect them all to take place in one chapter, let alone in one double spread. So then, I guess there's my overthinking sorted. But I love the fact that they so swiftly dealt with Orochi and just walked off as if they weren't taking him as a serious threat, as they were more focused on the bigger picture and this treatment of Orochi's character is a nice way of quickly bringing an end to this part of the feud. Not to mention, it's fun to witness Orochi die again. In saying that, considering we finally got the confirmation that Orochi is alive only in the last chapter, meaning that this all but lasted one chapter as we are now wondering about his fate again, I personally don't think that Orochi has completely died. For one, we only saw five heads decapitated in this chapter, and I think there is more we can get out of the story with Orochi still being alive. For example, whilst we have witnessed Orochi's response to Kiyoshiro being Denjiro, we have yet to see his reaction to Komurasaki being Hiyori. In addition to this, so far Orochi's devil fruit has mainly been used to intimidate people, but none of his abilities have been shown yet, which makes me think another battle is awaiting Orochi in which he can show us the full extent of his devil fruit. In any case, seeing the scabbards walk off from this battle increases the chances of Hiyori being the one to end Orochi, or considering he still has two heads left, perhaps we could see a mother and daughter team up, with Toki and Hiyori decapitating Orochi's final two heads, which in my opinion would be just perfectly satisfying, perhaps even Momo and Hiyori, or a combination of any of these three. I really enjoyed this scene, but I have to say that my favourite detail in all of these panels could be seen in the first page of this chapter, with the scabbard standing face to face with Orochi, with flames around him. This was just a very symbolic detail, as a word that comes to mind when viewing this panel is Inferno, which means a large fire that is dangerously out of control, and this aptly fits the situation of the scabbards. Figuratively speaking, Orochi made their lives a living hell and has also quite literally sparked large flames here. And to me, this emphasized that once the scabbards go beyond where Orochi, the gatekeeper to hell, is standing, only the flames of hell await them as they face the true demon, which is truly genius if intentional given the title and context of this chapter. Also, we seem to be getting a Raizo vs Fukurokuju battle, no surprises there as this is another fated interaction which had been hinted at earlier in this arc. It's cool to see the panel of them initiating their poses as we can see how unique and contrasted these two characters are. I am really excited to see a ninja battle and all I can say is bring it on! Nin? Nin? Fukurokuju is also becoming an increasingly intriguing character. I agree with Raizo in that I had pegged the Oniwa Banshu leader as an opportunist, so for him to side with Orochi thereby defying Kaido is very interesting and I'm keen to see Fukurokuju's character development unfold. But enough about the opening of the chapter, let's talk about what you all came for. The rumble match on the rooftop of Onigashima. There is no other word I can think of to describe this battle than intense. Wow. This is probably my favourite chapter so far involving the rooftop. Okay, firstly, a confirmation at last regarding how Law's power works, which should put all the questions to rest about how he can't just use his ability to switch the places of any opponents, particularly Devil Fruit users, to just throw them into disadvantageous situations like, you know, the ocean. And that is because he's unable to do so if someone's haki is too strong. 
The question now is, does his opponent's haki have to be stronger than Law's? Or can anyone with strong enough haki resist Law's ability? In which case, is there a certain level of haki that one must possess to resist it? Luffy is shown to use Future Sight again, this time to predict something big. And this word big seems like an understatement once we actually witness the devastating combined attack of Kaido and Big Mom. The pose of the two emperors prior to the attack, which marks the second time the bad guys are surrounded by flames in this chapter, which goes back to what I said about Inferno earlier, is also reminiscent to Dory and Broggy back in Little Garden, which makes me wonder. I know Big Mom has ties to Elbaf, but seeing how Kaido also knew how to perform this attack, could he also have some connection to the Island of Giants, or is this simply from his experience of fighting alongside Big Mom back in the good old Rocks days? Always new, interesting questions to ponder on after a new chapter. Anyways, this combined attack which resulted in a huge blast of impact, large enough to blow a part of the island which would probably have been enough to wipe out the supernovas had it hit them, but luckily it didn't. And luck came in the form of our favourite swordsman who so far has done what I would say not only the most important, but also the most impressive feat in this stage of the battle against the Yonko so far. Not only was he able to momentarily block a combined Yonko attack, which even impressed the grateful Eustace kid, but in doing so, he saved the lives of his fellow Worst Generation members. And we can add this to the list of cool Zoro moments in the Wano arc so far, of which there are plenty. More so than being cool and badass though, I think this chapter really highlights what we've been missing from Zoro's character in a while, and that is his grit and determination. Since we've entered the new world, Zoro has kind of just been cruising through things. Apart from his brief clashes where we see him struggle a little, Zoro has been mainly put into situations we could imagine him to have no problems getting out of. But in this chapter, here we saw him get up again after being heavily damaged and then continue to slice up Prometheus after receiving most of the damage from the combined Yonko attack which reminded me of what made Zoro one of my favourite characters in that he is able to persevere through the most impossibly difficult situations, and it was truly a sight to see. In saying that though, the last panel with Zoro coughing up blood does make me worry that the swordsman might be done for this fight. And now the question I'm asking is, will this continue to be a 5 on 1 fight now that Big Mom is out of the picture, or will it be 4 on 1 since Zoro seems to also be in trouble? If Zoro is indeed out, I think this is a good way to take him out of the battle without his character losing face. It's not surprising that this fight will have a big focus on Kaido against Luffy, Law and Kid, considering each of their respective history with the Yonko, so I expect Killer to be taken out in the upcoming chapters as well. Both Zoro and Killer will probably fight someone else and I think them fighting a Calamity or another prominent opponent will look good for both of them since they would be doing so after surviving a battle against two Yonkos. I love the brief one-on-one -on -one focus between Luffy and Kaido here. I think it's great that we got to see this now, as we may not get to for a while, seeing as this is now developing into a Supernovas vs Kaido battle with Big Mom taken out of the fight. It was a fun clash where you could see Luffy enjoying himself and even boasting a little that he made Kaido dodge an attack. I think it's also a good way to focus on and showcase Kaido's hybrid form. Now, on top of his strength and durability, Kaido has now further increased his speed and agility, not to mention keeping his destructive power, as seen when he used his hybrid version of Volo Breath and then quickly changed places to show us a new technique called Ragnaroku which is a pun of the chapter title Naraku, whilst also referring to Ragnarok, a Scandinavian mythology regarding the final destruction of the world. Speaking of durability though, I think this chapter really highlighted Big Mom's durability. We saw Kid shooting arrows at her, which just bounced back from her body, and the fact that the supernovas did this combined attack that yes, did result in Big Mom being removed from the battle, but you don't really see her take any proper damage from any of them. If anything, they just took advantage of Big Mom's weakness of being super strong, but not a very tactical fighter who relies too much on her brute strength and devil fruit power. Which is understandable, I mean, I guess if you have that much strength and such a powerful devil fruit, the tactical side of her would not be as trained as she wouldn't be used to requiring it so much. 
And here I think is a good time to give some respect to Big Mom. She has been a huge hindrance for the supernovas in this rooftop battle, and though they have managed to get rid of her relatively quickly, the fact that they celebrated so much afterwards shows what a great relief it is that they will no longer have to face her too, and how they had to prioritize removing her as they understood what a great danger she poses. And in saying that, the combined effort between the supernovas was great. I think it was just a great use of each of their abilities. There's no way that they could defeat Big Mom, so gaining a momentary victory the way that they did was really smart. We already mentioned Zoro's part in this, but Killer chasing Napoleon was hilarious and also made me question whether Kid is able to move the sword or does it have a similar requirement to Law's ability where he can't move weapons of those belonging to people with strong haki or simply because Big Mom has her soul in it. Wish this one could be explained. Perhaps Kid could, but he was simply focusing on distracting Big Mom so that he could send her flying, which I think is very smart. Kid tanking Big Mom's punches was also very impressive. It's funny that these two, Luffy and Kid, both took a head-on attack from the two Yonko, which I think further separates them from the other supernovas in terms of their focus. Since the beginning of Wano, these two have been shown side by side, so I think there are big plans for Kid in the upcoming chapters. And I know in my review for chapter 1001, I said that Law was the least impressive as he was only throwing rocks at Kaido, but now in this chapter, those rocks were the final blow to the supernovas gaining momentary victory by sending Big Mom falling from Onigashima. Which just goes to emphasize how Law is the most strategic of the bunch. In terms of Big Mom's fate, I really want to know where this is going. There's a few ways through which we could answer this if we get a confirmation as to whether she really is falling into the sea as she said, or are they already on top of Flower Capital? If it is the sea, it's likely that she'll encounter the rest of the Big Mom pirates or maybe even Perispero. Will she be back to join the battle or will she just leave in pursuit of the other Polniglyphs? And with those new intrigues and a very excited heartbeat, that brings us to the end of today's review. Please leave a comment below regarding your thoughts on this intense chapter and don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any future One Piece discussions. Please stick around for my reactions to this chapter if that's something you're interested in. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon. Alright guys, it's time for the chapter review of 1009 and I wonder who the title for this chapter is going to be. <gasps> oh! Okay, so we get a color spread. Another color spread with Jinbei in it. Yes! Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so it's all the straw hats plus Tama and Bunbuku. Yeah, and Komachiyo as well in the background. Is this some sort of foreshadowing detail? Ah, oh, but it's requested. Okay, maybe not. It says that it's been inspired by a reader request. <laughs> I love Frankie's jumper. I want a jumper like that. Yeah, they're eating their rice balls as usual. Nami looks very cool in that um, baseball cap. Usopp's um, jumper sort of makes him look like Chopper in Monster Point. It looks very furry, sort of. I thought that was, um, I thought that was Chopper with an Usopp face at first. It's so funny. All right, let's get to the chapter itself. And the title is... Naruku. What is Naruku? Hmm, okay. I don't think it's a character. Okay. Alright, we're starting within the castle. That was fast! The scabbards have already come across Orochi. It's interesting that Fukuro Kuju would help Orochi, based on his role. Sort of was portrayed to be a figure that would switch sides um, and team up with whoever would be the winner. Um, in which case, the I guess the sort of likely victor in this scenario would, most people would think, would be Kaido. So for him to team up with Orochi, um, I think that's a very, maybe it's because Orochi at least still has ties to Wano, whereas Kaido is a, is a complete foreigner. Um, but yeah, it's a, quite an interesting development of Fukurokuchi's character. Oh, he's turning into his, um, into his eight-headed snake form, the heavy, heavy no me. Bing, 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 bing. I love that they've got the shamisen playing, um, the level of detail. Oh, after 20 years of trembling at your ghosts, you will feel my wrath. Ah, oh wow, no mercy, look at that. No, they're not playing around, look at how many of those heads they've already chopped off. Yes, yes, wow, oh, 
Oh, so gruesome. Love it. Yes, we don't have any time to waste on the likes of you. <laughs> so great. You know, they've mentioned this before. Kinemon said um, earlier in the raid that the source for Wano's woes has always been Kaido, not Orochi. Um, and here they just swiftly attacked him. Oh, I love it. Hmm. And yeah, see, Raizo saying what I just said, you know, he didn't realize that he was such a loyal character. And yeah, it seems like those two, Raizo and Fukuro Kujo, are going to have a matchup. I think I mentioned it before in a previous video. I think I did. And that that was the matchup that I could foresee. Exciting stuff. Gonna see a ninja battle. Okay, and we're going back up to the rooftop. <laughs> How many of the five do you think will survive? Let's give them a big one. Oh, it's so scary, isn't it? It just really goes to show all the other terrifying attacks that we saw a um, couple of chapters prior. They're all just small, you know, meaningless, just still testing out the young greenhorns, not the serious big stuff. And so Law answers that question that we might have had. In that case, time to disassemble. I love just how incredibly wicked Kid looks. Just looks like a demon. The pointed eyes and the very pointed sharp um, smile. He's a wide grin as well. Oh! oh. <laughs> Who do you think you're sassing, boy? For her to call Kaido a boy um, really just puts into perspective how she must view the supernovas that have come to challenge her. Oh! Yes, look at Kaido in his um, hybrid form. There's no way to avoid it. Jeez. Wow, look at that blast. Conquest of the sea. <laughs> oh, Zoro. <gasps> oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh wow. That's n oh. We're all done for. My, oh, wow, yes, oh, oh, he's just faced that by himself, what, oh my goodness, what a beast, oh, what, yes, <laughs> my goodness, I can't believe he blocked that by himself, that's fantastic, yes, Sorrow. And where's Straw Hat Luffy? Gomo Gomo no! Red! Is it Red Rock or Red... Oh, oh he just dodged it. Oh, because it was going to hurt. Oh, look at Luffy taunting him. And look at his face. Before Kaido dodged Luffy's attack. Hee <laughs> hee. It truly looks like he's just having so much fun. He's used his haki and it still hurts. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, and Kaido's gonna. Oh, Kaido's looking like he's going to unleash a bolo breath. <gasps> no, conqueror of the three worlds. Wow. So it does. Oh, I really like Kaido's hybrid design. I quite like that. The long sort of dragon tail, like a, like a dragon centaur. <laughs> conqueror of the three worlds. Rag Naraku. Wow. Ragnarako. What? What is that? Metallic thing that he's controlling. Rum. Shambras. Oh. Yes. Okay. That's great. It's a bit of a red herring um, that, or maybe foreshadowing that at the beginning of um, sort of their segment, Law said that, you know, I can't move. Um, Kaido or Big Mom, their haki's too strong. Doesn't mean that Law's power is useless. Because look at that. Wow. Huh. Can you manage? I better. <gasps> oh. And look at that. He's taking on Prometheus. Slice. Just sliced and cut in the face. You know, use this jaw. Just. Whoosh. Wow. <gasps> oh, flame crossing the six parts. Oh. And yes, yes, killer is after Napoleon. Come back to me. Oh, that's so funny. Mama, help us. Punk pistols. Oh, look at that. Big Mom just using her raw strength. Wow. Oh, 
Ooh, lapel. Dun. Oh yes, tucked. Look at oh, I love it. Joint attack. A tag team between Laura and Kid. Oh, and then flying her off. They propelled her down to the sea. Help me, Zeus. Wow. Okay. And look at Zoro, just his smile, that satisfied smile. That was amazing. Yes. Oh. My goodness, I don't I don't even know what to say. <laughs> what an action-packed chapter. You know what between um the scabbards and Orochi and then between the supernovas and the Yonko, the two of the Yonko. Wow. Okay, so Big Mom seems like she's going to be out of commission for a while, but probably not for long. Um, you know, I imagine that she's going to run into a few of her other children. Seeing as Perispero is the only one that's arrived on Onigashima right now. And so that means we can see five on one. We can see the five of the supernovas against Kaido. That's crazy. And there's no break next week. No break next week. This is amazing. Wow. Okay. Bye.